Um, please join us in the response to the, uh, uh, in the gathering words, uh, which you find in the bulletin or up on the, on the slides in the front. We gather together in the awareness of God's love. We come together to open our hearts and minds to God's Spirit. We are here because we are God's people. Our presence here shows us that we commit ourselves to choices of life. Come, let us worship God. Let us sing praise to God. Let us sing our opening hymn, uh, hymn 289 in Voice of United, which you'll find in your bulletin and also on the cover. Sunday School, 
I know there's two little young men over here that will be heading up the Sunday school soon. Um, we'd like to thank uh, Sangje Noor, uh, our Sunday school teacher, and Lily Noor in the nursery um, for doing that for us. Uh, just a reminder that COVID protocols continue to be observed. So please, after the service, uh, please leave by the side aisles and try and maintain social distancing. Uh, there is hand sanitizer to use before leaving. Uh, we are monitoring the situation and will update everyone on what changes we will be making uh, when Nova Scotia reaches level 5. Uh, we received a thank you card and, and donation to the church from Tara and Josephine Poole uh, as, thank you for the, as thank you for the donations from, for Josephine and her friend's apartment. Uh, she was with us here last week. Oh, she is here with us right now, actually, sorry. So, you want to stand up and just wave there, we can see. So, she's expressed, she's expressed her gratitude uh, in words to me yesterday, or to us last week when we were leaving, and also the thank you card that she's given us. Uh, Pope Partridge is still serving to go lunches. They serve over 160 packed lunches each day, Monday to Friday. In addition to serving the hot meals and sandwiches, they are still needing donations of granola bars, juice boxes, fruit cups uh, to place in the lunch bags. Any healthy packed lunch size goodies. Um, um, Alison's friend, um, Phil, says yummy chocolate chip cookies. Food. I think it's Teresa's friend. Okay, it's Teresa's friend, sorry. Um, if you think it is worth it to add, uh, so, um, so uh, we will suggest to deliver 10 sailors casseroles um, for our August date. Uh, our next dates are October the 14th, which is full, and December the 9th, where there's two spots left. Uh, please contact Teresa uh, at ptmwasa at yahoo.com, we'll have that information if you want to. Um, yeah, if you're interested, please fill in the two spots that are remaining for December. And many thanks to Teresa also for her, for her leading this important ministry. Uh, Brunswick Street Mission uh, is still seeking expressions of interest for qualified applicants to serve on the board of directors and fulfill the role of treasurer. So if you're interested or know anyone who is qualified, please let them know. And the last notice for today is that uh, next week's service will be, will be led by Daria Langel, Langel and we'll have Dr. Ross Bartlett again the week after that. Uh, anything else that anyone wants to share? Anything else? Dear God, we are grateful for your constant presence in our lives. We acknowledge that every gift in our lives is a gift from you. We now join in this generous act of giving. Our offerings for mission and service shall now be received.
for the sake of social distancing, I'll just have the young folk sit there rather than come and risk being infected by me because I'm around students and who knows. I want to say how glad I am to be here. I was a minister at St. Matthew's, your neighbor, uh, for 10 years and we often did things together. It feels like a long time since I've had the gargoyles look down on me and so it's, it's good to be here and thank you for the invitation. Did you start school this week? Yeah? yeah so did I. I. I teach down at AST down on the Northwest Arm. And my, my students are a little older than you, but older or younger, going to school pretty much always the same. I wonder if you've ever heard the phrase, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Anybody recognize that one? Hands up if you do. Yeah, some of us do. Okay. It's supposed to. I mean, my parents taught me that one when I was your age. It's supposed to make us, I don't know, not worry about the things that people say. I'm not sure it's always true, though. Has anybody ever said anything really mean to you? To you? Anybody had anything mean to say? That hurts, doesn't it? And I can still remember some of the mean things that were said to me when I was your age. So, if it hurts us, when people say mean things to us, we probably hurt others when we say mean things to them. And so the lesson, if you like, for this morning as we, we start back to school, and I know there are other people here who are starting back to school in different ways. Try and think of what can you say to somebody that will make them feel better? Are you in a new school this year or the same school as last year? Same school as last year. Are there any new students in your class? I want you to think about what you can do to make them feel welcome. Maybe you remember what it's like being new in a place. Is there ways that we can help people feel welcome? Have you ever made a mistake in class? A teacher asks you a question and, and you get the answer wrong? Probably not you. I used to do it all the time. Have, and do people in your class laugh at folk who get answers wrong? And I wonder how that makes them. Or maybe somebody is left out when you're doing things at recess or whatever, and you can include them. So yeah, sticks and stones may break my bones, and names will never hurt me. It isn't entirely true. And sometimes it's easier to fix what's happened with sticks and stones than what we do with our, our words. I wonder if you could just say a little prayer. Dear God, we thank you that with our words, we can make a difference. Help us, God, to make our words kind and loving. Amen. Amen.
Our first lesson is taken from the Gospel according to Mark. Mark reading at chapter 8 and verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets, and he asked them, but you, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he strictly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo many things, and he be rejected by the elders, undergo great suffering, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his other disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on, not on divine things, but on earthly things. And he called the crowd to him with his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow after me. For those who want to save their lives will lose them, and those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will a person give to gain the whole wide world and forfeit their soul? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? And so those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. turn to the letter of James. James is a, an interesting letter. It was the one book of the Bible about which Martin Luther did not write a commentary. Because Luther called it a letter of straw. He said it didn't contain anything of the gospel. And I'm having trouble finding it here in your pulpit Bible. It's so small. Come on, you can do this. Can you tell? I haven't led worship in public for about 20 months. I don't know it's online worship. So this is the beginning for me too. The letter of James. And what James is trying to do is he's trying to teach a group of people who have nothing in common except their love of Jesus. They have nothing in common. He's trying to help them become community. And so he's got lots of practical advice. At least it seems practical to me. And it certainly seems to fit our time. You tell me whether you think I'm right. James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, brothers and sisters. Jenny, Bernie, any of you out there? Hmm. Not many of you should become teachers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large, 
that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a very small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members by the world of iniquity. It stains the whole body. It acts on fire, the cycle of nature. And by itself, it can set on fire. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue. The tongue is restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, it ought not to be so. Does a spring pour, th pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can fresh water yield salt water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show it. By the good life. These are offered as wisdom for the journey. Please pray with me. Touch us, O oh God, by the power of your Spirit, moving within us to open new doors and windows, cobweb with the patterns of the past. Invite us into your way of looking at the world and at people. By the power of your Spirit within us. Amen. Well, the media images are stark and terrifying. Pictures of hectares and hectares of forest burning. The pictures of exhausted firefighters. And of terrified people who have fled their homes with just what little they could grab in the last moments. Air quality warnings all across the continent. And not just Western Canada. The United States, and Australia, and the Amazon. Sometimes it seems as if the entire world is on fire. The Apostle James writes, how great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. As I said, James is a leader in the early church, in that first generation after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And all of these people are coming together. They are followers of Jesus, but they come from all sorts of places. And they have very little in common. And they're trying to build a community. And we know from life in the church, don't we, how challenging it can be to create community and maintain community. We bring different expectations and different backgrounds. And, and of course, because it's our background, we, we say, well, that's what we always do in church. You get enough people together saying that, you could have quite a, an interesting conversation. So James gives lots of practical advice about how people can live together 
in harmony and fullness and joy. And one piece of advice, how great a blaze is set, how great a force is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. When I asked, several of you remembered that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And as you heard me say to our young friends, well, that's true, but, and the but is really important because words can constitute reality. How we name things makes a difference. And who gets to put a name or a label on another person can make a tremendous difference in our world. Words and stories take hold. They have tremendous power for good and for evil. We can talk about scarcity. We can talk about the closing of churches and the imminent demise of religion. Or we can talk about the truth we hold, which is the generosity of God and the goodness of the unchanged spirit. So by our words, we can embrace or we can exclude. We can lift up or we can put down. I don't know about you, but I think many of us have deep down inside the memory of that critical voice. The voice that may have been part of our growing up years and comes up from time to time and makes us feel insecure and small. Or alternatively, you may have in your memory the voice of that elementary school teacher who said something wonderful about you. It may have been decades ago, but when you feel under pressure, when you feel down, you hear that voice and it buoys you up. Some of the things that we do today are triggered by the words that we remember, by the schoolyard bully, and we hurt other people because we're still that small and frightened child. Words are powerful. Sticks and stones can break our bones, and yes, names and words can hurt us. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. The tongue is a fire. Here's another saying you may have heard. Talk is cheap. You recognize that one? Don't believe it. The cost of speech can be very high. The same James that wrote that faith without works is dead wants to talk about the way our tongues work and the way we relate to one another verbally. He talks about how you can control a horse with a bit and bridle or a, or a large sailing ship with a rudder. We might want to say how small the steering wheel in a car is and yet how much weight of metal that can control. And so we hope that steering wheel is in the hands of a skilled driver. And if you've ever had your power steering fail on you, you know just how difficult that can be. The issue here is the tongue and what we do with it. And I imagine each one of us here could tell stories of both good and ill done by speech. I don't know how many of you are on social media at any length, but sometimes it seems to me as if our entire society is just waiting to go up in flames. Have you noticed? It seems that we can't just disagree with one another. We have to find ways to destroy the person who disagrees. It's not just opposing ideas, it's devaluing the entire person. Of course, the poster child for this is politics in the United States and the easy anonymity of social media, but Canada really is no different. Every now and again, I forget my own wisdom and I make the mistake of reading the comments after a news article online. Anybody ever do that? It's not good for your mental health. It really isn't. It feels like 
there is so much rage and vitriol and hatred. And it's not just social media, of course. We know that acts of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, acts against visible minorities, acts against those marginalized in society are on the rise. It's like our society is a dry forest just waiting to go up. And we know that, don't we, friends? We know how a tongue can set a blaze in a congregation, get somebody talking about something, and all of a sudden, if enough people repeat it, it has to be true. When we talk about people rather than talking to them, when we engage in speculation in the absence of fact, when we are allow our fears of the future and our dread of scarcity to overwhelm the faith that we have in the generosity and goodness of the divine, I can tell you quite truly, I know of congregations that have talked themselves to death. In the midst of wonderful settings with all sorts of human and financial resources, with all sorts of prospects, the story of scarcity and the story of ending took hold. Nothing good could happen, they believed. And so they literally talked themselves to death. So what will you say to one another in the weeks and months ahead? You're in a, a wonderful and a unique position here at Fort Massey. Two wonderful things are coming together for you in a, in a conjunction that gives you all sorts of power over your future. One is that we are gradually, oh so slowly sometimes, emerging from the pandemic. And the other is the time of interim ministry. The COVID-19 pandemic took many of our congregations right back to the very basics. Did you notice how much of the things that we spend our time and energy in church we couldn't do? Did you miss them? A student of mine talked about how COVID-19 cleared the table at his congregation. I thought it was a wonderful idea. Imagine that everything on the table has been swept aside in you. You get to choose what will be put back on the table of church. Think of the things that you've always done. Do they still give you life? Or is it time to retire them honorably? You can choose. Winston Churchill is quoted with the phrase, never waste a good crisis. Now, I don't know whether the words really belong to Churchill or not, but they're true. You have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to decide what will be part of your church life. You need to talk to one another and listen to one another and hear those words. Secondly, there's the period of interim ministry that you're entering into. I'm, a, I'm an accredited interim minister, so I know sort of what you will be doing in the next weeks and months. Part of it is separating from the, uh, the ministry of my friend Trent Cleveland Thompson, thinking about your memories of your time together. Some people will be filled with grief. There are stories that will need to be told. Some of you, I'm sure, are anxious about the future. You'd be a very odd congregation indeed if there weren't some people here who were anxious about the future. But others of you may be filled with optimism. This is a time to talk and to listen about what you will be as God's people here at the corner of Queen and Tobin. You don't have to worry about being church for the rest of Canada. You don't have to worry about the rest of society. What is God calling you to be the good news here, in this place. That's what the rest of us need you to be. What God calls you to be. Watch your tongue. Remember those forest fires. For we know that not all of the forest fires in British Columbia were naturally occurring. We know that some were sent by human beings, either deliberately or through misadventure. 
The town of Lytton, according to the evidence, seems to have been destroyed by a fire that was started by sparks from a freight train. Now, let me ask you, how many hundreds of freight trains have gone back and forth across those tracks? How many sparks have been cast off without anything happening? But on that one occasion, that one occasion, tragedy and destruction followed. Probably those who might have set the fires would say, I never intended it to be that bad. But it's like that with our words. Once we say something that is unkind or uncaring or something that we know is not the truth, it's out there and we can't control it. We launch something and it goes places we never imagined. A blaze sets on fire by the small fire that is the tongue. Bridling the tongue, controlling the tongue is harder sometimes than it might look. But we can do it. You can use your voice for good or for ill. You can sing the praises of God and lift up people who are downtrodden, or you can defame and attack and undermine. And one of the questions that I think we need to wrestle with is whose voice is it that gets heard? In our society, in the last couple of years, we've begun to have a conversation about what it means for folk of African descent to live in our society. And even more recently, we've begun another congregation about the often tragic and painful relationship between indigenous peoples and the dominant culture. And you know what I think James would say? I think James would say to folk who look like me, shut up for a change. Because people like me have told the story for a long time. It's our voices that have dominated. And I think James might say, listen and listen and listen again. Listen to hear. Too often when we listen, we listen in order to get ready to respond. Have you noticed that? We only listen to somebody long enough to get our answer ready, and then we're just waiting for them to stop so we can jump in. James would say, listen. Listen to genuinely hear. Genuine listening is sometimes difficult. Because sometimes what we hear is painful and unwelcome. So your words can be a blessing to others. You can build others up. You can chart a future which is different than the present. Your actions can be a blessing when you emphasize caring, gentleness, and a listening ear. Have you ever noticed when you decide to buy a certain make and model of car, how everybody around you seems to be driving them? Well, they're not really copying you. It's just where your focused attention is. And so if you focus on the good, that's what you will see. How would God have you speak in these days? Because with the power of speech, we can help heal the past and we can create the future. And the Spirit of God gives to you good friends, that creative power. How do you plan to use it? Let those with ears hear the Spirit's word to the church. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Creator, we give you thanks for the wonders of creation in which you have placed us. Fields and forests, rivers and lakes, mountains and oceans and deserts. We thank you for cities teeming with people from a myriad of race and backgrounds. Help us, O oh God, to hear the cries of all your creatures. We acknowledge that we have walked heavily on your earth, 
and the imprint of humanity's passing is everywhere. In our sometimes overwhelming desire, we have gouged and cut and burned and dammed up and emptied and extinguished countless beings who share with us this fragile earth. Help us to hear their cries. Help us to redouble our efforts to preserve and enhance life by lessening our impact and by changing our habits. Forgive us, we pray, when we despair about the size of the challenges before us, and we forget what is possible, especially by your grace. Bring us into connection and solidarity, we pray, with groups and individuals who are committed to making a difference. Help us to engage with those who can make a difference. Gracious God, in whose image the whole human family is made, break down the walls we erect, we pray. Help us to see in each human face not a competitor or an enemy, but a brother or a sister. Help those of us who have much of this world's goods to share with those who have less. Hear us as we underscore our commitment to renewed action with our prayers for those who are broken in body, mind, spirit, and relationship, whether known to us or unknown, but gathered in the quiet of our hearts. Jesus, our brother, our friend, taught us to regard you, God, not as a mysterious and threatening force, but as one who loves us so much and more than the most loving parent we can imagine. Therefore, in his spirit, we are bold to come to you as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn is, Though I May Speak, found in your hymn book and also on the screen.
We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. The hymn is number 676, For the Healing of the Nations.
in God's name. You are ambassadors for the good news of Jesus Christ. And the world is waiting for such as you. And so continue in God's world, bearing in your words and in your deeds the mark of the one who loves you and calls you to share this great love. And may the blessing of that love, shown in the creative work of God, made incarnate in the life and teaching of Jesus, and available fresh and new every moment by the power of the Spirit, may that love and that grace bless you this day and always. Amen. May it be so.